I speak to you in the name of God, who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. The official seal of my alma mater, Hamilton College, admissions packets available in the narthex, <laughs> depicts the angel of wisdom removing a veil from the face of a young student. On wisdom's book is written, looks at veritas, light and truth. The student's hands are stretched upward in amazement. Her face is pure joy. The student's expression captures the advent of wisdom, that moment when she realizes for the very first time that the world is more intricate and more complicated than she ever thought it could be. Over these last few weeks, I feel as though another sort of veil has been pulled from my face but my reaction has not been filled with joy. Through revelations of misconduct and corruption, we have all learned that the world is more complicated than we thought it was. And we have been left to wonder if there is any light amidst this truth. In our reading from St. Mark's Gospel this morning, Jesus speaks of dark days. Today's reading is the conclusion of a chapter-long monologue in which Jesus describes the end of time, what scholars call Mark's little apocalypse. <clears throat> All of these great buildings will be thrown down, Jesus says. Not one stone will be left upon another. There will be persecutions and betrayals. There will be earthquakes and famines. There will be false prophets and even false messiahs. There will be wars and nations will rise up against other nations. But do not be alarmed, Jesus says. This must take place. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. Jesus concludes his remark in this morning's reading. In those days, after all that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Is it possible that we are living in the end of days? Is Jesus about to come riding on the clouds? Maybe. I'd be delighted if he did, but somehow I doubt that he will. Sure, nations are rising up against other nations. We have sleazy people in government, and they are on both sides of the political spectrum. Powerful men are mistreating less powerful women, and public figures are using the teachings of our faith to justify conduct that is truly unjustifiable. I wish that I could say I'm shocked by the revelations of the last several months, but in truth, I'm barely surprised. There's nothing new here. And we sort of knew that it was going on all along. Corruption, avarice, and abuse have been around for a long, long time, even since biblical times. David killed the husband of his mistress in an effort to disguise their affair. Herod killed all the boys of Bethlehem so as to preserve his throne. Matthew, the tax collector, skimmed a little off the top for himself. Kohelet was right. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. 
What has changed in the last few months is not the nature of our society, but our awareness of the depths of its brokenness. Our veil has been pulled off. We have been dragged out of Plato's cave and our eyes are blinded by the light. Yet light and truth remain good things. Restoring a broken world is what Jesus does best of all. Remember what he said. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. In other words, a new world is on the way. I spent a good portion of this week studying Dr. King's letter from Birmingham City Jail in preparation for my class in the Rector's Forum this morning. One passage seems especially relevant for us today. Quote, We who engage in nonviolent direct action bring hidden tension out into the open where it can be seen and dealt with. Injustice must be exposed with all of the tension its exposing creates to the light of human conscience and to the air of national opinion before it can be cured. Despite the terrible circumstances of its writing, Dr. King's letter from Birmingham City Jail is forward-looking and filled with hope. Like the prophets of old, Dr. King lived expectantly. He believed that God really would make things better. And he lived his life as though God already had. A few years back, the Most Reverend Desmond Tutu was interviewed on public television. The interviewer asked Archbishop Tutu if he was optimistic about the future of a democratic South Africa. The Archbishop replied, I have always said that I am not an optimist. I am a prisoner of hope. And that is a different kettle of fish. A prisoner of hope. What a wonderful phrase. Optimism is insufficient. We must be imprisoned by hope. I fear that our generation may have lost that sense of hope, that deep conviction that God will set things right. But we can get it back. Jesus did not come for the sunny days. He came for the dark days. Jesus came with a bottomless supply of light and of truth, with the promise of restoration, and with the power to heal. For most of the people around us, I suspect that this Advent will end just like the last one did. Jesus will be in his manger, not in the clouds, and the Herods of today will remain on their thrones. But how will it end for us? How will it end for you and for me? If we are disciplined and intentional, these next four weeks can remind us just how much God loves us and retrain us on the hard work of living expectantly. Light and truth will dawn again this Christmas. Amazement and joy will be ours for the taking. Take them. Grab them. Hold on to them with all your strength. The world is dark, but it is not too dark for Jesus. It never has been, and it never will be. A new world lies just beyond the horizon.